Thank you. Can you listen to me? Is this okay? Okay, thank you for the introduction. Hello again. So uh, let's continue with the ideas this morning. We were talking about how to review early our designs. This is not easy. Eh? Remember, I am from the university, so I am theory, no? <laughs> or it's supposed, no? It's, it's not easy, really. Um, uh, now we are going to have another uh, view to our problems. And the idea is uh, coming from the idea of, from the point of view that you are failing. So what can you do to fix a problem that is uh, failing? No, you have a prototype and you are failing in radiated or conducted emissions. The idea with this uh, session is that if you can see it, you can fix it. So it's very important to have instrumentation. I like a lot oscilloscopes for debugging because in the same instrument, you have time domain you have frequency domain and you, which you have several uh, channels, ideal number is something like four channels. You have the possibility to combine different probes, voltage probes, current probes, blah, blah, blah. This is what I will be uh, um, showing today. So let's start, no? Remember, we are interested in emissions, immunity, uh, radiated or conducted. In any way, you go to the laboratory and then you will fail, remember? In emissions, you put the device under test at some distance, typical, typically three, 10 meters, 30 meters, something like that. You put an antenna, and this antenna will be measuring the electric field. Typically, antennas are with rods, not loops. If the antenna is measuring with rods, they are measuring electric field. Okay? It's not necessary to measure magnetic field. Why? Because you are in the far field. And the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field in the far field is 377 ohms. It's a constant in the far field. In the near field is different. When we are in some distance, something like, for example, lambda over six, the distance between the near and the far field from the EMI point of view, not from the electromagnetic point of view, that is more complicated. Yes. You need to analyze the system from Maxwell theory, no? But this is a good number to consider when you are in the far or in the near field. So we are measuring electric field and what we get in the instrument is a voltage over some kind of impedance that typically is 50 ohms, the input impedance of your spectrum analyzer or your EMI receiver or your oscilloscope, okay? The second possibility is measuring conducted emissions. Conducted emissions uh, will be in the demo tomorrow, in the demo uh, with my uh, session about filtering, no? But the idea is similar. Instead of the antenna, you are uh, offering to your product in the power supply cable, some kind of known impedance. So your product in that direction is looking at a known impedance. So all the people is able to measure in the same conditions. No, the noise you are injecting in the power supply is dependent on this impedance. If we are not in the same impedance, we are not. We cannot compare with the same limits. No. So this is the main function of the line impedance stabilization network. This is a topic for tomorrow. Anyway. The, the idea is uh, basically the same. We have, we are failing in radiated emissions in this case, okay? First thing to do, I was explaining this, uh, this morning, this idea. You have some kind of limits, let me draw in this way, and you are failing, no? If you put your device off, this is what you will get if you are in a good laboratory, something like this. It's a low noise level, no? So you must be, well below the limit to be able to measure with some efficiency, no? If you go with the marker to some specific peak, you will find here something like, I don't know, uh, this is 100, so let's say this is 140.0000 megahertz. So it's very easy to consider that when you see a lot of zeros, this is coming from a crystal. It's very difficult to create this frequency with parasitic oscillations or with some kind of uh, resonance, no? So you look uh, at your circuit and you say, oh, I have a clock that is 50 megahertz, 60 megahertz. And this is one of the harmonics that is being radiated. But sometimes this is not so easy. Sometimes you will get some frequency over the limits, 20 dB, 30 dB, something like that. 101.345 megahertz. And this frequency is not in your design. Remember, one possibility, A, is that you have resonance. 
you have inductance, you have capacitance, there is no losses. So typically the solution is to introduce some snubbers, some ferrite, or something like that to kill the resonance, to dump the resonance. The other possibility, remember, is to have a parasitic oscillator. When you have a parasitic oscillator, when you have gain and you have feedback. So for example, you have a DC-DC converter and you do the layout of the input and the output trace is one close to the other, and then you create this parasitic feedback. And it's a typical problem related with the layout of your traces or the layout of your cables, no? But you don't know where this energy was created. It's in the display section, it's in the DC-DC converter, it's in the microcontroller board, the power electronics, I don't know. So we need to find some uh, a strategy to find where the, uh, the signal was created. If you are in a, a small company and you work trying to solve a problem and you are here, you will say, we pass. Uh, this is dangerous. My recommendation is to be, I don't know, at least six dBs below the limit because there is a lot of differences between different laboratories, different instruments, different days, no? With the same prototype. So this is because EMI is so crazy, crazy no? So I go to the laboratory with my product. This is my product, okay? It's a sealed -it box because where I have slots and apertures for ventilation and I have cables. I have only one is the power supply cable. And inside I have electronic circuit. It's a representation of a product that is easy to carry with me for traveling, okay? And this is the product we will be designing. But the product is fairly, look at this. This is conducted emissions. In conducted emissions, what you will get is a result that is typically from 150 kilohertz up to 30 megahertz. And you will see two limits because you need to measure the quasi peak at the average of the emissions. Hmm? I like to say if your neighbor is in the uh, night doing a noise, something like this, boom, only one time and you wake up, huh? but no more. So this is a problem, but it's not a very big problem. But if your neighbor is doing this all the night, this is a very a small amplitude signal, but it is not very, it's very unpleasant. No? So this is what we try to identify with this kind of detectors. Not only the peak, it's how periodic is the, the noise we are working with. So the idea is we are failing in a lot of frequency over the limits, 20 degrees, 10 degrees, something like that. And tomorrow we will try to solve this problem with filters, okay? We will need a line impedance stabilization network. And in radiated emissions, I have been, I am obtaining something like this one. You see the peak of the limits, legal limits or the limits of my customer. Sometimes the limits of the customer is below the legal limits, no? And you can find that at this frequency, I am failing. This frequency is around 100 megahertz, 130 megahertz, something like that. And it's a broadband emission. And this frequency is not a frequency I am using in my design. So remember, I have two possibilities. One, perhaps I have some resonance, or B, I have some parasitic oscillation. This is the idea. We will try to find these frequencies in the circuit. And we are going to try to find where this energy was created. Demo. Remember, the sealed it enclosure, the power supply cable, and my instruments. This is the recommendation related with this session, is you have one oscilloscope, up to some specific frequency. What is good for EMI? At least 500 megahertz, better one gigahertz. But remember that perhaps very soon you will be working with 2.4 gigahertz or higher frequencies in your design, wireless system, for example. So perhaps you need to go up to three gigahertz, three gigahertz, something like that. Huh? But remember that the idea is to have a very good FFT because we are trying to replace the work of the spectrum analyzer in some way in real time. So you, we need to calculate very fast, you know, typically by hardware. So uh, the idea of the instrument is the possibility to see the signal in the screen in both domains, tight domain and frequency domain without moving cables, without changing different probes or changing the input impedance of the instrument we are using. No? What is the typical problem with this kind of uh, products that are failing when we are close to production? The, custo the customer or, or your boss says, you cannot change the PCB. 
no, no, don't move this from here to here. We cannot change the cables. The mechanical design is fully finished. It. So you can do nothing, no? The question, you know, is can you solve by software? No, it's impossible many times, no? My recommendation, this is what I take for the meetings, is to buy this probe. And you say to your boss, you can do magic. <laughs> it's the only possibility to solve the problem with the pros. Okay, this is a joke. Let's see, let's see what I am going to show you with the PC, okay? No, with the camera. With the camera, you see that my product is on top of the table, and this is the cable. One of the things I like to do is to fix things in place with tape. This is very important. You have, especially you have a lot of cables, try to have always the same configuration, no? So you fix in place your cable, so you avoid movements. This is a very basic setup. And then I can switch on my device. The first thing to do is to try to repeat the emissions in my oscilloscope. So let's see how is the screen of my oscilloscope. You see? Good? Okay. So this is the screen of the oscilloscope. I, I am not sure if, okay, that is better, probably. Okay, so this is the channel number one. In the channel number one, I will be using one antenna. Obviously, this is one antenna for being able to travel. No, very small. It's a dipole, not a specifically an EMC antenna. So you put the antenna in channel number one. So you, what you are doing is I'm going to capture electric field. The electric field is offered like a voltage and the voltage goes to the instrument with some specific input impedance, 50 ohms typically, because this is a transmission line that is 50 ohm in characteristic impedance. What you are picking up is electric field. So it's very important how the, is the position of this cable, this of this antenna. If this is horizontal, you will be able to pick up electric field lines that are horizontal. If you put the antenna vertical, you will be able to pick up electric fields that are vertical, no? Because sometimes you are radiating in vertical polarization, sometimes you are uh, radiating in horizontal polarization, no? You, you make this test in the laboratory. They rotate the product 360 degrees, they put the antenna up and down, and they rotate horizontal and vertical, no? So we put the antenna in some fixed position. Let's see if you can see the camera, okay? The antenna is here. Okay, in that position, here, okay? And it's connected to channel number one, okay? So the first thing to do is to measure how is the output of the uh, uh, antenna with my device under test off. This is very important because uh, I, I, perhaps I have a lot of ambient noise and this noise is not created by my device, no? So this is time domain. Let, let me put less volts per division. I can see activity. This is not activity from my product, it's from the environment, all the uh, electronic circuits we have here. And we are going to see the FFT, the FFT of channel number one. If we open the menu of the FFT, it's very easy to see how we can work with the FFT today in oscilloscope. In instead of knowing how many pairs you need to take, the idea is to put the start frequency and the stop frequency or the center frequency and the span, like with the spectrum analyzers. So because I am interested in the range around 100 megahertz and we start in 30 megahertz, I will start in 30 megahertz. Let's put here 30 megahertz and let's put here in the stop frequency 300 megahertz. The resolution bandwidth is important to identify what frequencies are coming from, uh, to have some kind of um, uh, um, frequency resolution, okay? You cannot change the resolution bandwidth in official measurements, but you can change it when you are doing debugging to analyze what is below these mountains you are radiating, no? Let me uh, increase the intensity of the trace so you can see better. Uh, let me go here. No, this is not a menu. Let's go here, uh, settings, the uh, persistence, and then we increase the intensity. This is only to have a better picture for the screen. Okay, so this noise is not created by me. Let me switch on my device. Obviously, you can remove this if you are measuring in a semi-anechoic semi chamber or you have some kind of case cell intent. 
or something like that. No, you can see this is with the device under test on. This is with the device under test off. Obviously, if you are in a laboratory like this one, you will have a quiet area and the bugging is easier. But you can see that in the area of 100 megahertz is this area here. When I switch, obviously it's the area of, we have the FM broadcasting radio, no, 88 to 108 megahertz. In this area, you will see an increase in emissions that is related with the activity in my circuit and my failure. Right? Really, you can identify I have a lot of peaks inside of this mountain. No? So this is the area of interest for me because I am failing in this area. So the idea is I am radiating. So if you go to the system, you are evaluating who can be radiating, the PCB, the metallic enclosure, or the cable? What do you think? The cable. Why, how do you think about this? The idea is very simple. You think at what frequency you are failing, no? Oops, sorry, what? <laughs> the gas. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, at what frequency you are failing? Let's see, is 100 megahertz? Remember from this morning, 100 megahertz is a size that is 300 over 100. This is three meters. So what do you need to radiate something like this 100 megahertz? Something that is big. Typically the slots will not be able to radiate 100 megahertz because the box is very small. If your product is a big chassis in there are slots of the doors or something like that, you can have good antennas, but for 100 megahertz, typically the origin of the problems is cables. Remember from 30 megahertz up to 400 megahertz. No? Remember that perhaps you have energy here. We will see this later. This energy is not radiated by the slot, but the energy is here around this area. So the possibility to have a cable that is going on top of the slot or close to the slot. So the cable pick up the noise and radiate is high. That is because it's so important to avoid cables going close to the slot internally and externally. Both situations are dangerous. Okay, the same for immunity. If you inject noise, this slot will not be a good opening for very low frequency signals and you will need higher frequencies to go inside of the problem. So I'm going to consider that is the cable, no? Later I will be using um, uh, NIFI probes. So what kind of cables you need to check? You need to check cables that are vertical or horizontal, okay? If your product is failing in horizontal polarization, the idea is that if this is your product that is on top of the table, probably the problem is coming from the vertical cable. Oh, sorry. If you are failing in vertical polarization, look for vertical cables. Okay, this is the idea. Because in this way, you are injecting current in the cable and the current in the cable is creating a vertical electric field. If you are failing in horizontal polarization, look for horizontal cables. That is the situation typically when your product has another unit and they are connected with a cable that is on top of the table. This is a general rule to consider, no? Another possibility to think, looking at the screen here. If the cable is radiating, the cable is passive. It's a passive system. So the only possibility to radiate is that you are exciting the cable. And you have two possibilities to excite. The first possibility is what we call the differential mode currents. So it's current that is going in the red wire and is returning through the black wire. This is not a problem, typically. Why? Because the two wires are one close to the other. What is very dangerous is if you do something like this. No, if you create a loop, the problem is that the loop will radiate. At this point, I have a magnetic field that is created by this cable and another magnetic field that is created by this cable. They are different distance with the same current. So the magnetic field here is not canceled. If you put the two wires, one close to the other, that means there is no loop, there is cancellation at some distance. So typically you can have amps of, of current and you will not have a good radiation at distance, okay? The other possibility is common mode current. 
the common mode current is going through the two wires at the same time. I have seen products where there is only one wire, the red wire. This is very dangerous. Why? They are using the chassis for the retro path. So the loop is totally uncontrolled, okay? Always you need to have two wires. So one wire is the forward path, the other is the retro path. So if we consider that this is the origin of my emissions, what I'm going to check is how is the current I see in this cable. So I go to my current probe. This is the current probe. The current probe, the, the, the accessories I am using are in the slides. So you will be, receive a copy of the slides. So in the slides, you have the model, bandwidth, things like that, no? So what I recommend about probes, the probes must be able to be open. If you buy probes that are closed, the problem is that sometimes the connector don't go through the hole and you will not be able to measure currents, okay? So you open and the output of the probe is a voltage. The voltage that I have here is proportional to the current I am measuring here. And the ratio between the current and the voltage is what we call the conversion factor, the current probe factor, blah, blah, blah. There is different names. Usually you have this from a calibration project process and you have this information from the manufacturer, okay? This is when you are interested in measuring how much current you have. If not, you don't need to know this factor because in this way, you measure the current without the ferrite and you measure the current with the ferrite. And the idea is that uh, you see the difference, no? what is really what you are working for. So let's put the current probe around the cables this way and go to the channel number two. An important thing in radio frequency, the current is not the same here and here than here. If you go to the school to learn about high frequency effects, you will see something like this. In low frequency, the professor says current or voltage is a function of time. So for the low frequency people, you have two wires and I have here 100 milliamps. Here I have 100 milliamps. The, 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 the value is exactly the same in the same instant, no? If the value is going up and down, it's going up and down at the same uh, time in all the position of the wire. But if you go to learn radio frequency, you will learn that the current is a function of position and time. So while in this current, I have here, a, 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 while in this wire, I, the current is going from zero to 100 milliamps, perhaps in this point is going from zero to 200 milliamps. And at this point is always zero milliamps. So what happened with the Murphy's law that you will put the current probe here. If you put the current probe in a position of the cable where the current is always zero, you will say, or you will think there is no current in this cable. So you, it's important to move, okay? You are looking something that is the maximum or you are looking for a position that, and then you will not move the probe, no? So if I select this, probe, this position, I will not move the probe in my next steps. Why the probe is here and that is here? Because in the next part of the demo, I am going to introduce here a ferrite. So you put a ferrite here, and to put the ferrite here, you move the current probe. The difference is because the ferrite and the movement of the current probe. Another important thing is to make a new experiment. So you open the probe and you put the probe here without going around the cable and the output must be zero. If not, the current probe or the cable is picking up noise. Typically in power electronic, you will have a strong DVDT and you can have noise that is not in the wire. It's being captured by the um, uh, setup, by the measurement setup. So when you have, or you, when you are sure that it's not this kind of problem, you put the current probe and you measure. Something that is interesting. If you measure in these cables more than 50 mi 15 microamps, then you are in danger with more than 15 microamps at three meters in a typical length of cables from one meter to three meters, the electric field is higher than the legal regulation. 
So this is something that you can do in your prototypes. If you measure the current probe with the current probe, the common mode current, and in some cable, you have more than 50 microamps, don't go to the laboratory. Try to reduce this energy, okay? Uh, this is important if you go to the laboratory and you fail. If you go to the laboratory and you fail, go to the chamber and measure with your current probe how much is the current you are injecting. Because then in your company, you will try to repeat the test and without the semi echo chamber, you can do things, no? Because you can measure, you can try to repeat the same current magnitude and then you start working to reduce, I don't know, 20 degrees this current. If this current is reducing 20 degrees, the electric field at three meters will be reducing 30 degrees, 20 degrees, no? They are proportional. This is the idea. So let's see how is the picture of my, let's see. Ah, no. Okay. Sorry. It was disconnected. What happened here? Why is not? Okay, don't worry. I have another possibility to connect. This is the, the problem with real demos, no? In MATLAB, all is working or in PowerPoint. Okay, this is the screen of the oscilloscope. So let me activate channel number two. It's in green color. So we put here. What is this? This is the time domain signal from my current probe. This is the time domain signal from my antenna. Okay, let me plot the FFT of the current probe. FFT of channel number two. And we put here to compare. And then let's go here and to change the start frequency to 30 megahertz, the stop frequency to 300 megahertz, and then the resolution bandwidth to 100 kilohertz. And then we switch off. Look at this. This is very similar, not specifically the same, no? If you switch off your product, what happened? If you switch off your product, you will detect in the cable activity because the cable is a good antenna for picking up signals. It's receiving the FM band. You can see here, 88 to 108. This is the problem when you are failing in immunity, radiated immunity, because the cable is picking up this signal from the antenna, and then it's introducing this signal in your product, and then you will fail, okay? But now you can see that when my product is on, I have the possibility to identify some kind of current here that is proportional to the electric field I am radiating. And usually it's easier to measure with the current probe because the antenna is very sensitive to the possibility to have my body, metal elements or something like that close to the antenna. The current probe output is usually more stable, okay? So how is your main uh, consideration now? Is to look at this current and if you are failing in electric field 20 degrees over the limits, you make changes in your design to reduce this current 20 degrees. You can change the software, you can change filtering, you can change switching a slower, I don't know what your product is able to apply. Okay, well, how do you select the ferrite? This is the idea. The most important thing to understand with the ferrite is that when you are using a ferrite, you are introducing impedance. If you put a ferrite in a circuit, you are introducing impedance. In my case, because let me, let me draw in this way. Let me draw. This is the red color wire. This is the black color wire. This is the, my power supply cable. Let me copy this one. Copy. Let me paste and let me paste. You have three possibilities. One possibility, oops, sorry. One possibility is that you put the ferrite here. Other possibility here or in the black wire. The other possibility is to put the two ferrites in the two wires. And the final possibility is to introduce a ferrite 
around the two wires. No? Remember, when you are trying to do something like this, if you are radiating, it's because you have a one arm of your dipole, the, of your monopole, you have a voltage that is in point A, and this voltage is related to some specific radiation surface, no? the ground plane of your PCB, the chassis of your product or something like that. So why are you radiating? You are radiating because you are injecting signal in your monopole. So one possibility to reduce the emissions is to reduce the length of the wire. Impossible. Another possibility is to kill the voltage. If you convert the voltage between A and B equal to zero, there is no radiation. This is related with the design of the PCB and how the cable is connected to the PCB. Not a possible here in my demo. The other possibility is to introduce impedance here. And this impedance reduces the current you are injecting. This is the idea. So you will go to your, uh, let me see if I have here, let me see. No, it's not here. You go to your uh, ferrite kit and you try to go to a ferrite that is doing something like this. This is impedance versus frequency. Uh, the ferrite from your preferred manufacturer will do something like this. This is the impedance module, no? Let's see, let's consider that this is the frequency of my problem. I will take this ferrite because the maximum of impedance is at the frequency I want to kill. The other two ferrites are not useful for me. And I discover that this impedance is something size 600 ohms. So what is this 600 ohms uh, impedance? If you look at the data sheet of your manufacturer, you will see something like this. This is the reactive part of the ferrite. And this is the resistive part of the ferrite. The total impedance is composed of a resistive part and a reactive part, inductance, nano Henry, not micro Henry, because there is not a lot of terms around the, the core, okay? So what you are interested in is in the resistive part. Why? Because when you are filtering with inductors and capacitors, the noise don't disappear. The noise is reflected. Inductors, micro Henry's, nano Henry's, and capacitors, picofarads, and microfarads, they are storing energy components. When you, when you are using resistors and ferrites, you are interested in the resistive part. Then the noise is dissipated, disappear. But you are not using a resistor. You cannot introduce a resistor, especially in this application. Why? Because if you introduce a resistor, the impedance of a 600 ohms resistor is doing something like this is present from DC up to high frequencies. You only want resistive effect at this frequency, not at lower frequencies where you can destroy the uh, signal integrity of your signal, no? So if I go here and I put the ferrite in one of the wires, I will be filtering differential mode. I am not interested in differential mode. If I put the ferrite in the two wires, I will be filtering differential mode and common mode. I mean, the noise that is going in this direction and is returning in this direction finds 600 ohms and 600 ohms in series. And the noise that is trying to go th through the two wires in this direction finds 600 ohms in each wire. But what happened with this? The ferrite is in series with my power supply cable with my one amp, two amps, 20 amps consumption. And I can saturate the ferrite. You need to check if the ferrite is not saturated. So because my problem is only common mode, I will use a ferrite around the two wires. If you use the ferrite around the two wires, you are introducing resistive effects in the two wires for the common mode, but for the differential mode, the effect is zero. Because one of the currents is creating this magnetic field and the retor current is creating the opposite. So differential mode currents are creating a net magnetic field inside of the core that is zero. No saturation. 
and no filtering. But I, I am not interested in filtering in differential mode. So you go to the data sheet, you take a ferrite that is offering the maximum impedance, and then you put the ferrite in position, okay? Let's go to the heat of my ferrite. I will be using this Burth Electronics ferrite. And then you can put one turn, two turns, three turns. I will be using two turns. Remember that you add turns, the, the, max, the peak will increase, but it's going down in frequency. Take care about that. You can check this with a network analyzer or with one impedance analyzer or frequency response analyzer, something like that, no? Let me save in memory first the result of my previous measurement, no? So we, I add a reference signal. Let me update. No, not for this one. It's for the math number two, update. And then I close and I put here in the middle, the reference. The white color is the signal saved in memory without the ferrite. Now I am going to put the ferrite in place. This is what I am going to do. You take the ferrite, you try not to move the current probe, not to move the cable a lot. I will try to do the best. Okay, and you put the, fer the ferrite in place. Oops, sorry, this way. This way, okay? And then you will be able to compare. This is not, wait a moment. It's not reducing as much as usual. Let me put here again. Where you put the ferrite? In theory, the best position for the ferrite is as close as possible to the, to the uh, uh, output of the noise, no? It really, if you put the ferrite at the end of the cable, you can have the opposite. With the ferrite, you have more emissions than with the ferrite. Why? Because the ferrite at this position means some kind of impedance. And at the frequencies where, where this is multiples of lambda over four, what you see here is a short circuit. So the short circuit here absorbs more energy and you will radiate. So be careful about where you put the ferrite. The best position in general, is in that situation. So you can compare. I am not reducing as much as other days. Anyway, let's see, okay? You can see that the difference in peak is the distance. I have around 10 dBs. So I am obtaining more, more or less three or four dBs. This is usually in the experiment, I get more 10 dBs, eight dBs, something like that. But remember, when you are filtering with the ferrite, you need to consider that the effectiveness of the ferrite depends like with any other filter depends of the terminal impedances, no? So if I am introducing between this system and this system a serious impedance, the effect of this ferrite will be big if the terminal impedances are low, no? For example, if this is 600 ohms, this is 10 ohms and this is three ohms, the effect of this ferrite is very good, okay? Because I have a, a strong mismatch, okay? But if you have here 10 Ks and you have here 20 Ks, 600 ohms in series is not a good solution. It's better a parallel capacitor, a sunt capacitor, de acuerdo? Okay? So when you have different impedances, you need to put the series element in one direction and the parallel element in the other direction. So in EMI filters are not um, um, uh, sym symmetrical, okay? You need to know what impedance you have on the left and on the right. You don't know that because it's very difficult to know these impedances in a real circuit. So the best thing to do is to try both orientations, okay? This is one of the possibilities to test the circuit. So now, uh, in the next step, you can be interested in finding the problem with near field probes. You need to go to this slide to understand the idea. Let's go here to one of my previous slides, this one. Let me clean the window and look, look at this. Remember, we are in the far field. This is not true because my antenna is on top of the table. The idea is in your lab, you put the antenna at one meter, two meters, three meters, depending on the size 
of your room. Eh? You are doing the bagging. You are not making official measurements, no? But you are here. So you are measuring electric field. And then with the electric field, we can calculate how is the magnetic field? Because we know that in the far field, this ratio is constant. Eh? Um, the idea is that if we are here, 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 and here, the, the impedance, the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field is always 377 ohms. This is the wave impedance of any electromagnetic signal. In this condition, the antenna is receiving a plane wave. Remember from the school, magnetic field, and electric field, they are orthogonal. And the product is the pointing vector, is the direction of propagation, no? In this condition, I am not, I have no possibility to know if the origin of my signal was a low impedance circuit or a high impedance circuit. It's impossible because I am receiving a plane wave and the ratio is constant. It's only dependent of the media. This value came from this ratio is the ratio between the permeability and the permittivity of the air, the propagation media, not from the source. So you are here, you are in the far field, okay? And then, because you are in the far field and you find that you are in creating emission at 100 megahertz, you say, let me go close to the circuit to see where the signal is created. And then you go here and you start to work like some kind of several holes, no? You are in the near field. This is fully different. When I am in the far field, I am using antenna. When I am close to the, to the origin of the circuit, you will identify that the wave impedance start to do something like this. This wave impedance start to go to higher values or start to go to lower values. Look at this here is the same. Why? Because the electric and the magnetic field are attenuated with one over the distance. Both of them, they are attenuated with the distance in the same way, but here are not. They are attenuated in a different way. So for example, if the origin of the signal is a source circuit, I mean a loop, you have a loop in your cable, you have a loop in your PCB, something like that. A loop is a low impedance circuit. You have current, with a small voltage. So in this loop, there is a lot of magnetic field and there is less electric field. So the ratio is a small. That is because the wave impedance goes down, trying to be equal to the impedance of the circuit. If instead of this, you have a point with some kind of voltage and some kind of antenna, a wire, something like you, we can represent like a monopole, no? a circuit where we have a strong DVDT or a strong voltage and less current because the circuit is high chain impedance. Look at this, the cable is open. Current don't circulate easily. What is important here is a lot of electric field and a small magnetic field. The ratio is big. So when you go close to the circuit, you need to identify both sources. That is because you will use some kind of kit with nearly probes. Let me switch to the slide here and let me show you the idea easily. You will take a kit of near field probes like this one. Let me go here. This is the slides, this one, okay? You can see that in the kit, you will have different loops, big, medium, or a small size. With the big loop, you can scan the full board you detect that the origin of the emission is on top of the DC-DC converter. And then you switch to the smaller probe to look around the DC-DC converter, what component, including SMD components, has a strong activity, diode, inductor, the transistor, something like that. And then you study the layout and the schematic to see what happened in your circuit. Perhaps it's a resonance ringing, perhaps it's a parasitic oscillation, remember. So you look at the layout to find the, the problem, no? But you are using a near field probe. This is not one antenna. Antenna is when I am in the far field. This is a system to pick up magnetic field. If the system is high chain impedance, with this probe, you will not pick up signals. You need to switch to the electric field probe that usually is a small tip, a small bowl, 
or a small flat area to pick up electric field line. The output of these probes is the derivative of the current in the circuit. The output of this loop is the derivative of this probe is the derivative of the voltage in your circuit. So you have the possibility to integrate. You will see the current or the voltage in your circuit without touching, without loading, not like with a probe, but you will have a full um, picture of the waveform. Okay. So this is what we are going to do. No, I go to the PCB and I connect to my cable my near field probe. You see here. Okay. This is my near field probe. It's a not very small loop. And uh, look at the, the cable. Sometimes in this kind of cables, it's useful to introduce some kind of ferrite in the coax cable to avoid common mode current. Remember uh, that uh, in my new experiment, I was trying to pick up noise from the cable, no? So I go to channel number three. I'm going to remove the white signal. And uh, let me activate the channel number three that is in orange color in the center, okay? So this signal is the voltage in the output of my probe that is proportional to the derivative of current that is creating the magnetic field I am picking up. But the derivative and not the derivative for a sinusoidal signal is the same, cosine or sine. So if you have, you have interest in finding a specific frequencies, you will find these frequencies in the sine or in the derivative is the cosine, no? The frequency, the waveform will be different, but the energy will be in the same frequencies, okay? So let's uh, go to the FFT to activate the FFT in this channel. Again, we are going to switch to 300 megahertz in the FFT setups from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. I'm sorry, this one, no? From 30 megahertz, okay? 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. 30, sorry, 30 megahertz. No, okay. Ah, let me stop frequency 300 megahertz, start frequency 30 megahertz, and resolution band is 100 kilohertz. Exactly the same like with the other probes. No, I am far from the circuit. If I, if I go close to the circuit, something like this, something like this, okay, I'm going to do this. Let me remove the, the cable. Uh, sorry, the ferrite from the cable. Okay. And let, then I'm going to do something like this. No, I'm going to put the ferrite, the, the probe here. I will be on top of the slots and I will be scanning the seams or the apertures in the mechanical enclosure. This is one way to check you have leakage at some frequencies. No. So, Let's switch to the PC. And you can see when I go close to the circuit, the signal in the middle increase in size and you will find the origin of the emissions in the cable. We can go on top of the enclosure. There is no big emissions here and we can go around the perimeter of the box. There is no a strong activity. Let me do something like this. Let me go to the camera. Let me open. And you will see a power supply and a fan. It's a 12 volt fan, nothing more. It's a DC DC converter, our enemies in EMI. And let's do this. Look at this. I am going to put the cable from the, from the fan and the cable from the power supply in this position. Look at this. They are close to the top of the box. So when I put the cover, these wires will be close to the ventilation hole, okay? You have seen that there is no activity in that position. Let me put this here and let me go with this. Okay, this one here, you can see this. Depending of where I scan, I can have more energy or less. Oh, you are not seeing the PC, sorry. Okay. You can see that I have, I can find where is the leakage from the slot only because the cable is closer to the 
apertures. Eh? This is very, very important. No? If you want to see this in one slide, we can go here and we have a measurement about the activity in the slots. Eh? You can see that there's energy because I, have, I am in outer scale. I have red color in the peaks. But if I, instead of scanning the board, I scan the board and the cable, you can see I have this. The red color in the slots is reduced, but I have energy, but the red color appear in the cable. So the energy is going through the cable and the cable is radiating the energy. So it's very important to have a good filter exactly where the cable go out to the world. No? So the cable is not able to radiate the energy. Remember, basically in common mode. Hmm? Some question? No? Okay. So let's go to the last uh, idea. The last idea is to be able to find how the energy is being created in my circuit. So I open my box this way. Let me remove the cables so you can see with the camera. And let's switch to the smaller Nifl probe. I oh, know this is very small. Let me switch here. Okay. So I am going to scan around the PCB and I will be on top of the inductor. So you can see the output of my PC. When I am top of the DC DC converter, I have a lot of energy. Sorry, this way. Okay, let me switch on to the camera. So the probe has been scanning the full product. And when you are in top, on top of the DC-DC converter, I find the maximum emissions from my product. This is what I get here. So I say the energy is coming from the DC-DC converter and from the DC-DC converter is coupled to the cable, no? So I go to the last probe. The last probe is a voltage probe. It's a passive voltage probe. And then you start to see how the digital circuit is switching, how the power electron is the circuit, how your signals are in the device. So let me press it here. Let me connect the probe in channel number one. And let me connect the probe to the circuit. I'm going to do in this way. Okay. Later I will explain this one. This is the switching activity of my circuit. Okay, this one, this way, and this is the trigger. Okay, so this is the square wave switching activity of my power electronics product, okay? It's a square wave signal. Duty cycle is proportional to the output voltage, no? It's, it's a parameter that is controlling a constant voltage in the output. So I'm going to say the FFT. I, I like to see always the time domain and the frequency domain of my signals. So we go from DC up to, I don't know, 300 megahertz and with a resolution bandwidth of 100 kilohertz. Okay. And you see this, you see that for a square wave signal, what you have is even an odd harmonics that are reducing the amplitude as you go high in frequency to the infinite, no? But look at this. At some frequency, I detect this increase. This increase is in this signal. So let me activate the FFT gating option. With the FFT gating option, let me activate gate. And you see here a window. It's a semi-transparent window. I can move the window, this one. I can move the window or I can increase the size of the window this way. I can move and I can decrease the size. So we can go through the time domain signal and we can see the FFT where is the energy at the frequency of interest. Then we can remove the FFT and we can extend this waveform. So we find With the cursors, we can go from peak to peak this way, from this peak 
to this peak. Okay, and we, you can we, you can find that the distance between the two peaks is uh, 120 megahertz. This is the ringing that is the origin of the problem. So the origin of, of the problem was a resonance. L and C inductance and capacitance, no losses. So this is an underdamped situation. If you introduce an snubber, a ferrite, or losses in general, perhaps you solve the problem. You need to check the behavior of the DC DC converter, the efficiency, things like that. If not, you will need to change the layout to minimize these parasitics so they disappear instead of trying to kill the noise with additional components. Okay? So, like a last uh, comment, the idea of the session is to show that if you have the scope with both domains, time domain and frequency domain, and you have different channels, you can combine different point of views. With voltage and current, you have the Kirchhoff or Ohm's law point of view, circuit theory. With the electric and the magnetic fields with near field probes, you have the point of view of Maxwell. And with the antennas, you have the same point of view of Maxwell, but in the far field. With all of them, you have the possibility to analyze where you have the problems and you, to try if your solutions can be uh, interesting to go again to the laboratory for measurement. That's all. I think it's some time, no? Yes. Some questions, no? Yeah, thank you very much, Arturo. So I want to remind everyone that we are recording the session and it will be available in a few days. It will be sent via email. We will also send you the slide deck of this presentation. I also want to remind you that you can ask questions via the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the Zoom webinar interface. Please type in any questions that you might have. So we will start now with the questions from our audience we have here on site at our MPS location. Are there any questions? Yes. In some of the uh, experiments uh, I observed, uh, antenna is vertical, sorry, antenna is horizontal, and harness is uh, very much influencing. Uh, but see, as you said, like when they're in line to each other, we can see more emissions. Sometimes in vertical, I see more compared to horizontal. So what is the phenomenon? Uh, I, don't, I don't know your product, but if you detect a lot of uh, vertical activity, yeah. there is no vertical cables. Probably you have the power supply cable in vertical. No. no? Only, only horizontal. So you have a big, at what frequency? Maybe FM band. FM band, 100 megahertz. So your product is uh, big in size? Small one. Is it small? Yeah. Oh. So in theory, if the product is big, you need to look for, but it's, it's long in this way. Yeah. So it's the uh, horizontal slot. That is the problem. So when you have a problem in, in emissions, let me switch here to draw. If you have a product that is failing in this way, the, the cable is vertical, remember, a current that is going in this direction is creating a vertical electric field. But this is the, the important thing about slots. Consider this. What is the dipole? It's a piece of wire and another piece of wire, and you are exciting with a voltage between A and V. If you excite these pieces of wires at a frequency, F0, where the length of the wire is exactly this value, you are in the best antenna to radiate or to pick up these signals. For other length, lengths, you can radiate or pick up, but this is the optimum, okay? If you do this less than lambda over 20, if you make these pieces of wire very, 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 very short, you will not be able to radiate. The energy is not able to go to the far field. Now, take it where you see metal, put air, and where you see air, put metal. So now I have a plate, in this way. So what's happening in this situation? When you are radiating energy from your product, from your circuits, your cable, your PCB, you are exciting the metal plate with currents. And these currents cannot flow like they want. 
this slot is impedance. So if you have current and you have impedance between A and V, the idea is that you have a voltage between A and V. This voltage can be measured. You can measure here the voltage and you will see that this maximum, the voltage here you will see that is zero and the voltage here you will see that is zero. It's the opposite here. The current here is zero, the current here is zero and the current here is maximum. So in this situation, what you have is a voltage between A and V. So the, ver the electric field between A and V is vertical and the magnetic field like you can do with your right hand rule is horizontal. So the pointing vector goes perpendicular to the slot, but the, look at the electric field is vertical. So when you are failing in vertical polarization, in general, you look for vertical slots, or vertical cables or horizontal slots. So if your product is on top of a table with the cables in your, are horizontal and you have a, a slot that is uh, in your case, 100 megahertz means that lambda over two is around 1.5 meters. Perhaps it's not so big, no? The slot. The cable is the table of the counter is together with the counter is actually like a plug. Uh, like a loop. Yeah. Ah, but, th but this is the difference. I, the cable is not close to the chassis, close to the metal plate. No, but, but I mean, but the electric field will be horizontal anyway. Yeah. Yes, 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 I understand. But I am trying to understand where is coming the vertical activity in your problem, no? So that is because I am trying to find the possibility to have a slot in your enclosure that is horizontal. Because if you have a slot that is horizontal, the electric field is vertical. This is the idea, okay? Okay. More? So is there any more question from the people who have joined, uh, joined us on site here? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, in general, yes. The idea is that if you are using an electric field probe like this one, if you are using this electric field probe, this electric field probe is not sensitive to magnetic field. So you will be picking up electric field. And these magnetic field probes are usually electrically shielded. So they are done, so they are not sensitive to electric field. Obviously you will have some kind of um, sensitivity, no? but perhaps it's 40, 50 dBs lower than the sensitivity to the magnetic field. So the, the, the energy that you are measuring is magnetic field. Yeah, yeah. But you want to compare with a non-shielded inductor. Okay, so you can use the electric field probe, obviously. I don't like to touch, don't touch the probe. This is important. And you can use some kind of accessory like this one. I like to put the probe, especially electric field is sensitive if you touch or you move, no? So you take something that is in plastic or wood and you put the probe on pos in position and don't touch. You save the result in memory and you and make the change of the inductor and repeat the test, no? but without touching. Let you feel is very sensitive to your body. More? So we are running out of time a little bit. Perfect. So thanks a lot for okay. the presentation. Thank you. Thank we you. also had some questions coming in via online. We will answer these questions uh, via email. So we are changing the set, setup now for the next presentation, which will be done by Jens Hedrich.
So please stay online in this webinar. We will be back in a few minutes.